When I was a boy, I thought I could change the weather. I remember inventing rain-making rituals in my backyard. On sweltering summer days, I would draw a picture of a plump blue rain cloud and place it in the middle of the lawn. Then I'd march around it, splashing it theatrically with a potion of hose water and yard trimmings. As I grew up, I abandoned this mythology and replaced it with science. Rain, I learned, was an inevitable outcome of atmospheric physics. It was something that we and other living creatures passively received. Life on our planet did not create or conjure the weather. It simply experienced it. Lately, however, I've come to see things differently. I've started to realize that we and other living beings have much more power over the planet than is commonly believed. In fact, I now understand the relationship between Earth and life in an entirely new way, one that has returned me to a sense of awe and possibility I have rarely felt since childhood. The journey that brought me to this new understanding began when I learned an astonishing fact about our planet's largest forest. The Amazon rainforest does not simply receive the rain on which it depends. The Amazon generates about half of the rain that falls on its canopy each year. And the process by which this happens is truly fascinating. Rain clouds need two essential ingredients to form water vapor, and little airborne particles on which that vapor can condense. The Amazon provides both. It pulls huge volumes of water from the soil and releases what it does not need to the atmosphere. In parallel, it spews invisible plumes of tiny biological particles. Pollen grains, fungal spores, microbes, fragments of insect shells. The wind sweeps these little pieces of biological confetti, known as bioaerosols, high into the atmosphere, where they accelerate cloud formation and stimulate rain. But the giant floating mass of water and biology discharged by the Amazon does not remain in place. It travels throughout the continent, bringing much-needed precipitation to other parts of South America. And, through long-range atmospheric ripple effects, the Amazon even influences weather as far away as Canada. So a tree growing in Brazil can change the weather in Manitoba. The Amazon's secret rain ritual challenges the way we typically think about life on Earth. Historically, Western science has emphasized that life is subject to its environment, not the other way around. Even some of our greatest scientific luminaries have espoused this view, claiming that life's influence on the planet has been relatively slight. Learning that the Amazon summoned rain and changed weather around the world made me question this conventional wisdom. I started to wonder how else life dramatically alters its environment, not just locally, but on a scale of a continent, an ocean, or even the entire planet. I needed to know, how has life shaped Earth? I have since discovered that contrary long-standing maxims, life has been a formidable geophysical force throughout the planet's history. Microbes, plants, fungi, and animals have radically altered the atmosphere, continents, and oceans, turning what was once just a lump of orbiting rock into our cosmic oasis. If we traveled more than four billion years into the past, we would hardly recognize our planet. Ancient Earth probably had a hazy orange atmosphere with essentially no oxygen, and a vast ocean dotted with volcanic islands but lacking substantial land masses. Life was integral to the transformations that made the planet we know today. More than two and a half billion years ago, photosynthetic ocean microbes known as cyanobacteria began to oxygenate the atmosphere, a permanent shift that was later reinforced by land plants. In doing so, they dyed the sky blue, formed the ozone layer, and made fire possible. Microorganisms contribute to numerous geological processes. They carve vast caverns and concentrate precious metals. 
They're responsible for much of Earth's mineral diversity. Some scientists think they also played a crucial role in the formation of the continents by lubricating basalt and facilitating its subduction and eventual conversion into the granite that forms the continental landmasses. Marine plankton emit gases that increase cloud cover and accumulate in layers of deep sea sediments that can buffer ocean acidification. Animals as diverse as elephants, prairie dogs, and termites continually reconstruct the planet's land surfaces, improving the circulation of air, water, and nutrients. And all manner of life forms collectively converted the planet's once barren crust into fertile soil. But life does more than just modify the planet's structure and chemistry. Life is also intertwined with our planet's capacity to regulate its climate. You see, carbon continually cycles between various reservoirs spread throughout our planet. When there's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, the planet can enter an extreme hothouse state. When there's a lot of carbon sequestered in the deep sea and crust, the planet can freeze. But there's a stabilizing feedback loop built into the system that allows the planet to gradually pull itself back from such climatic extremes. It's known as the planetary thermostat, or more technically, the carbonate silicate cycle. If Earth enters a torrential hothouse state, a combination of geological and biological processes transport and sequester carbon in the deep sea and crust faster than volcanic activity can return carbon to the atmosphere. Over hundreds of thousands to millions of years, this feedback loop pulls carbon down from the atmosphere and cools Earth. Conversely, when ice smothers the sea and land, those same processes of carbon sequestration slow down significantly. So carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere and the planet gradually warms. This carbon-based thermostat is just one example of the many ways in which life is entangled with our planet's ability to maintain not a strict equilibrium, but a dynamic balance. The co-evolution of Earth and life also seems to have stabilized the level of atmospheric oxygen and to have calibrated the chemistry of the oceans. The overwhelming evidence of life's intimate interconnectedness with the planet recalls one of the most provocative ideas in the history of science. That Earth itself is alive. That our planet is a single, self-regulating, living system. Within the canon of Western science, this idea was most famously articulated as the Gaia hypothesis co-developed by British scientist James Lovelock and American biologist Lynn Margulis between the 1960s and 80s. One of Lovelock's favorite metaphors for Gaia was a giant redwood tree. The majority of any mature tree is dead wood, which is just laced and ringed with thin strips of living tissue. Similarly, the bulk of Earth is inanimate rock, which is wrapped in a flowering skin of life. Well, Lovelock argued, just as those thin strips of living tissue are essential to keep a whole tree alive, Earth's living skin helps sustain a kind of global being. Initially, many scientists harshly criticized and even ridiculed such ideas. In the past few decades, however, the scientific opposition to the concept of a living planet has diminished significantly, in part because so much new evidence has come to light. Today, it is universally accepted within science that life has been a major geophysical force for at least three and a half billion years, that Earth and life continually co-evolve, each changing the other, and that together, life and the greater planetary environment form a single, highly interconnected system. Many scientists further acknowledge that life is integral to the planet's self-regulating processes. These ideas have become the pillars of a relatively new mainstream field called Earth system science. Claiming that Earth itself is alive remains provocative. Many people who oppose this idea make the same objections. Earth cannot be alive, they say, because it does not eat, grow, reproduce, or evolve through natural selection like real living things. But hang on. 
there's never been an objective measure nor a consensus definition of life. Instead, textbooks typically offer long lists of qualities that presumably distinguish the animate from the inanimate. Yet the two cannot be categorically separated. Many of the things we consider inanimate have fundamental features of the living and vice versa. Fire consumes fuel as it grows. Crystals faithfully replicate their highly organized structures as they expand, yet most people do not regard either as alive. Some organisms, such as tardigrades or brine shrimp, aka sea monkeys, can enter a period of extreme dormancy during which they stop eating, growing, or showing any signs of life whatsoever, yet are still considered to be living organisms. Life, then, is more of a spectrum than a category. Life is more of a verb than a noun. Life is not a distinct class of matter, nor a property of matter, but rather a process, a performance. Life is something matter does. Although science has not yet settled on a definition of life, many experts in the past century have favored a variation of the following. Life is a system that actively sustains itself. The laws of thermodynamics suggest that the universe is moving inescapably towards a state of maximum entropy, which means that eventually everything must fall apart, dissolving into a homogeneous mush. Living systems temporarily evade this fate by using available energy to reduce their internal entropy and maintain what would otherwise be an improbable degree of organization. Theoretically, any system of matter with sufficient complexity and an adequate supply of energy can participate in the phenomenon we call life. We need to become more comfortable with the idea that life happens at multiple scales. The scale of the cell, the organism, the ecosystem, and even the planet. I've come to see life not as something that simply inhabits or resides on the planet, but rather as a physical extension of the planet. And I like to make an analogy to a vast beach from which spontaneously emerge all manner of intricate sand sculptures. Just because these structures have attained a new level of complexity and organization does not mean they're suddenly divorced from the beach. They're still made of the same grains of sand that surround them. They are still literally the beach. It's exactly the same with earth and life. Life emerged from and is made of earth. Life is thought to have originated some three to four billion years ago. Back then, the only matter available to become life was the matter of earth itself. Thus, the matter of life is the matter of earth. What we call life is earth animated. And because life is so ubiquitous, it endows Earth with a planetary scale anatomy and physiology, dramatically increasing the surface area of the planet that is capable of absorbing and transforming energy, exchanging gases, and performing complex chemical reactions. So, if we accept that life is a literal, physical extension of Earth, that together, Earth and life form a single, tightly coupled system, and that this greater planetary system demonstrates many of the fundamental features of life. Anatomy, physiology, evolution, and perhaps most importantly, self-regulation and astonishing resilience, having endured for more than four billion years, then we must recognize Earth as the largest known living entity. That doesn't mean Earth is a single living thing in exactly the same way as a bird or bacterium, nor that it is a superorganism akin to an ant colony, but rather that our planet is the largest known living system, the confluence of all other ecosystems, with structures, rhythms, and self-regulating processes that resemble those of its smaller constituent life forms. Life is not identical in all of its manifestations, but it echoes, it rhymes at every scale. So Earth may not be a giant organism, but it is alive. It's a vast, interconnected living system, suspended in the vacuum of space, 
eating starlight, pulsing, breathing, blooming, and continually defying the forces that would otherwise undo it. Nothing could be more characteristic of life. Thank you.